All right. The next talk will be by Christina Workman, and she'll be talking about how accessible websites can benefit everyone. Yeah, if you like it. You like it? Yeah, sure, that's right. All right, hey everybody. Um, as it says, I am Christina Workman, and thanks for coming to Accessible Websites Benefit Everyone. Uh, that will be the prevailing theme. So, come on. I'm testing out a new app that I literally just put on my computer like an hour ago. So bear with me, because now it's not working. I bet you it's stalled out. It's not connecting again. That's fine. Story of my life. All right. So a little bit about me. As it says up there, I am a front-end dev at a company called AmericanEagle.com. It's a digital agency. I've been working with WordPress for about 13 years or so, give or take. Um, I've been an event organizer within the WordPress community, meetups, word camps, kids camps, contributor days. Um, so I've really embraced the WordPress community and I hope you will all have found already, if this is especially your first word camp, that there's a lot to learn from the community. Almost everything that I've learned in these 13 years that has gotten me to where I am, I learned from a meetup or a WordCamp, or from talking to somebody in the community, reading their blog posts, seeing something they put on Twitter. So the community, if you haven't figured that out yet, is a great resource. I am also an aging neurodivergent. I have bifocals this year. <laughs> Before that, I used to look at my phone like this. So, um, and just my fun, I'm a lover of tea, sloths, and if you don't notice, um, all things purple. So, this talk, first of all, what this talk is not about is how to fix your site, how to make it more accessible. What it is about is a little bit of intro to web accessibility and disability, and then primarily we're going to go through some real life scenarios, and from those scenarios we're going to talk about barriers that could be experienced by somebody in those scenarios, and then also talk about other situations or things that may happen to anybody in the general public that they may experience those barriers as well. So my goal is hopefully by the end of this talk you will have a better understanding of why accessible websites are so important for everybody, not just the people that are labeled as disabled. All right, so before I actually get into this, I looked up 2017 Stats Canada said about 22% of the population over the age of 15 was listed as somebody with a disability, at least one disability. They may have several. Some of those disabilities may have nothing to do with using a website, so we're not even necessarily looking at all of those people. So we'll say roughly 20% maybe of people using websites, so that's a fifth, right? So like a handful of you maybe if we were doing the ratios. But as you'll see, inaccessible websites are a problem for everybody. So we're not just talking about those people. But the reasons that I hear from agencies, freelancers, clients, all that kind of thing, there's a lot of common reasons that you'll hear people say why they don't want to put in any investment or time into making their site accessible. So one of those is it costs too much. OK, it does cost a little bit, but it's worth it. And there are lots of counter arguments to things like if you start it sooner, like at the very beginning of your project, and just build it in, bake it into your process and everything you do, it won't cost too much. And the sooner you implement it, 
the less it's going to cost. This is what I hear from designers all the time and clients and everybody, but designers especially are worried that they're not going to be able to be as creative as they want to be. They're not going to be able to make things look how they want. It's going to just wreck their design. There may be some things that you're a bit limited in, but for the most part, you can still do everything you want to do. You just have to make sure that you implement certain things to make it accessible in different ways. So something like, we'll talk about some things later, but movement, right? Some people, they can't deal with lots of things moving around fast or videos playing. So as long as you have, it doesn't mean you can't put that on your site. You just have to make sure that you provide a way for somebody to stop it. You can still have all of those things that you want to have, mostly. So this is not valid. And the last one that I hear the most, my site visitors don't have disabilities. So again, they're thinking 20% of Canada, those people aren't going on my website. Not true. This is the one that gets me really riled up. So this is the one we're going to focus on. My site visitors don't have disabilities. Not only do I guarantee you, you have site visitors who are disabled, I also know that other people on your site are going to benefit from you making your site accessible. And you may be wondering, Christina, how can you promise me that? How can you guarantee this thing that you say? Every one of you, whether you realize it right now or not, has had and experienced a disability. Every single one of you. I doubt that there's one person at the end of my presentation who will be able to say, none of that applied to me. And if you do, please come tell me. I want to know. So, like I said, we've all experienced disability. Disabilities can be permanent disabilities, like those people reporting to Stats Canada. And an example of that would be somebody maybe with an amputated arm. But disabilities can also be temporary. Somebody with a broken arm is now temporarily disabled. And disabilities can be situational. So an example would be if you're carrying an armful of groceries into the house and you get a phone call or you need to look at something online or you're, maybe you're uh, using Lyft or Uber to get back to your house from groceries and you're trying to deal with that. So there are all kinds of different types of disabilities that we can experience at any time. So we're going to go through four scenarios. The first one, imagine you get home from work. If you work remote, pretend you don't. And you have to feed your kids, or your dog, or your cat. Although the pets don't really work for this one. You have a migraine. You've had a long day at work. And for extra fun, your kids are really excited and loud and bouncing off the walls, which is just adding distraction to your already brain fogged mind because of this migraine. So you think, okay, fine, we'll order in. We'll go to, go to a website, pizza place, whatever you want, favorite place, we'll order delivery. And then you can just chill and the food will come and everything will be okay. Until you hit that website. So there's some potential barriers that you could end up having. There could be confusing navigation. You may not know exactly where you're supposed to go to place the order. There might be, the order button might be hidden somewhere. Maybe they want to tell you all about their restaurant or their policies or, or whatever else. So if the navigation doesn't make sense, you're going to have a hard time, you're going to get frustrated. Maybe the buttons and links are also hard to find. Um, sometimes you could have things where they just don't look like links, so you don't even know where you're looking. Another one is you have too many links or CTAs. If you've got all in the same line, uh, subscribe to my newsletter, buy my product, contact me, somebody who is experiencing this situation is going to look at this and go, which one do you actually want me to do? 
Another, so like I already mentioned, fast-moving animations. If things are binging at you all over the place and you can't stop it and something's spinning around, that's just going to cause so much distraction. I've actually felt nauseous from some sites that move too much. And then, assuming you actually get to the order, you place, get ready to place your order, you get to the checkout form. Checkout forms can have tons of barriers in them. You could have placeholder text that magically disappears as soon as you start uh, typing in, and there's no label to tell you what's going on. So imagine you're back in that scenario I've described, and the kids in the other room, all of a sudden you hear a bang crash, and this is no longer important. You go figure out what that is. You come here, you've half typed stuff in, and now you don't know what on earth that field was for. And half the time in that situation, you backspace, and it still won't tell you what it was because the placeholder text is just gone. I've had where I even just temporarily get distracted for no reason, and all of a sudden, I don't know what I'm doing there anymore. So text holder, uh, text holder, placeholder text instead of labels is a really hard one. And sometimes, this is a little more rare these days, sometimes you're not able to click into a field. Sometimes field forms will only let you progress from one to the next to the next. And you can't go back and you can't go any further forward than the one. That's not a good experience either. So, given this scenario, if you were to hit all of these barriers, eventually you would just give up trying to order from this place and maybe give another restaurant a try online. But the chance of you ordering from this place anymore, gone. Bad experience, not gonna happen anymore. So these are all examples of neurological disabilities. Some more examples you can see there. Brain fog, lack of sleep. Anybody other than me last night, right? Maybe you're sick, you've got a flu or a cold. Maybe you have anxiety or depression, which can in and of themselves cause you to not focus properly on things. Maybe you just have stress. We all experience stress sometimes. And maybe you're just in a distracting environment and it's hard to focus on anything. So how many of you, hands up, have experienced at least one of these things? So if you look around the room, that was a lot more than 20% of you, right? And I know some of you just didn't want to put your hand up. I wouldn't have either. So, um, yeah, so those are all examples, like I said, of neurological disabilities. So this is why we know neurological accessibility benefits everyone. So next scenario. You decide to remote work from a local coffee shop today. Get stuck on a problem. Chat GPT has not been invented yet. And you search for a tutorial. You find the perfect video, but it's embedded on a web page. It's not, you can't find it on YouTube or anything else. It's on this page. And darn it, you forgot your headphones at home. How are you going to watch that? So, if there's no closed captions, you can't read it. If there's no transcript, you can't read it. If video is the only way that that information is presented, you don't get that information and you don't get to solve that problem. Another issue that can happen is if video is set to autoplay. Now, for this particular example, it's not necessarily a barrier, it's more of a potential embarrassment. If you've ever been somewhere where it's kind of quiet and all of a sudden something autoplays and it's all loud and in your face and everybody looks at you. Um, but it is also a barrier in other situations as well. And I have actually been, there was a site, I used to do maintenance on sites every week. And every week there was this one site that would catch me off guard. You'd think I'd learn. It took me months. Every time I would run the updates, I would go and I would check the site, and this video would just start music playing and blaring at me, and I literally jumped in my chair once or twice. So, no autoplay. So these are examples of audio accessibility. Some other things you might see, you might have tinnitus or tinnitus, depending on how you pronounce it. Uh, maybe you've got a plugged ear, you know. I flew in here yesterday and it took a little while for my ears to pop. Um, you might be skimming text to find a quick answer. I personally 
hate watching videos to get information. I would much rather just scroll down, find the bit I'm looking for, and be on my way. Maybe you're learning a new language. Subtitles, closed captions, are amazing for helping people learn a new language by watching somebody talk, but still also having that text in front of them. Maybe you've got your blog hooked up to a digital assistant, um, and they need to be able to access transcripts to know what your content is about. Again, loud environments. If you are in that coffee shop and it's not quiet, but it's really loud, you may not be able to hear what's going on in the video. And so again, having that ability to read it would be really helpful. And you know, if you're like some members in my family, when they watch TV and movies, we're a native, English is our native language. But they will watch English movies with subtitles on because it helps them focus on what's going on. So these are all examples, like I said, of audio accessibility. So audio accessibility, again, benefits everybody. Next scenario. Let's say you're one of those, I bet you there's a couple of you in here, WordPress developer, any kind of developer. You don't even have to be a developer. Some people just don't like taking their hands off the keyboard. They know the short codes for everything. Their hands stay put, mouse doesn't exist. So, you decide to register in an online course for the latest and greatest headless platform. What kind of barriers might you experience? Maybe there's a no skip to content option. Now, luckily, WordPress, generally, most themes have a skip to content option. So we're covered there. But some themes don't, so you still have to be careful. And what that means is you're able to go, as soon as the page loads, you're able to skip the whole, everything that's in the header and just get to the content so that you don't have to read it. And you may think, well, I want them to see and know what's in the header, but maybe this is the fourth page in your site that they've hit. They've seen the header. They just want to get to the content. Um, and then sometimes there's keyboard traps inside your main navigation. And so when that happens, instead of when you tab through, if you have a bunch of submenus, ideally you want them to be able to click through each top level and then carry on. And if they want to open up the submenu, they can. But if your menu isn't coded properly, they go to this one and it opens the submenu and they go boom, 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 boom. And then they go to the next one and then it opens the submenu and they go down. And so by the time you finally get to the other end, you're exhausted from just navigating the menu and you haven't even seen the content yet. Maybe there's no focus indication. So when you're tabbing all along, you have no clue what link you're actually on. If you hit enter, you don't know what's gonna open. Or maybe you have unexpected tab behavior that takes you, I've had a couple of sites where it goes all the way down to the chat box in the bottom. I don't want to talk to you yet, I want to read your stuff. And again, maybe the registration form is full of keyboard traps. So some of those things I mentioned before where if you can't go backwards or forwards or um, you just you can't navigate purely with a keyboard, you need to have a mouse. So these are all examples of keyboard accessibility. Some examples here that could affect anybody at any time. Maybe you have a broken arm, wrist, finger. I've had all of these. I launched a site with an arm in my, my arm in a sling once. Typing like this isn't fun. Maybe you've got carpal tunnel syndrome and it's acting up and you just need to have something else. Maybe your mouse battery died. <laughs> you've got one of those Apple Magic Mouse happens all the time. And my favorite, maybe you've got a baby or a pet sleeping on your lap. One of my dogs loves sleeping on me if I'm sitting on the, lap, my, on the couch with my laptop open. And he will, he's so silly, he will sleep, he'll beg to lay on my lap. I put my computer on top of him and he will stay there for half an hour. But then his head goes right on my arm and I can't use this one anymore. So, keyboard accessibility benefits everyone. All right, last scenario. 
Imagine it was last month. Temperatures are high. You're like me, I live in Calgary. We don't have air conditioning out there very often. So I don't have air conditioning. So windows need to be open. And we know there were lots of wildfires. Everybody across Canada and lots of the top states had a few days at least where those wildfires were causing poor air quality, even if you weren't in those areas, right? So if you've got the, air, the, the windows open and the bad air quality, your eyes get irritated from the smoke, and your vision gets blurry. And maybe you're actually closer to those fires than what I've been in, and you have to evacuate. But where you evacuate to is a more rural area. It doesn't have good Wi-Fi, and you still have to do your work, so you need to rely on that poor Wi-Fi. So some potential barriers we can see here. Your eyes are blurry, right? So if the text is too small, or even in some cases too skinny, you may not be able to read what's on the page. If there's low contrast between the background and the text for paragraphs, buttons, anything, you may not be able to actually read that text. You might not even see it or know that it's there. Maybe, again, there's hard to find links. If you've ever seen a paragraph of text that's in black and there's a link for some of the words in dark blue, good luck. If your content can't be resized or zoomed into, there's, you know, those small skinny texts, if you want to try to read them, try to zoom it in. But some content can't, it's not responsive. And I've been on sites, on my phone even, where not just images, but content, text, was scrolling off the side of the page and I couldn't scroll to get it. That half of the text, completely invisible to me. And that wasn't even zoomed in, that was just poorly mobile <laughs> responsive. And sometimes if you're in bad Wi-Fi or you're having Wi-Fi issues, Key images may not load, and if there's no alt text available to tell you what's going on there, you're not going to know. So these are visual accessibility issues. And these are kind of, I put this one at the end because these are kind of some of the ones that people tend to think of first, and sometimes only. And so I just wanted to make sure too that we all know that it goes way beyond what you can see. But some, other examples of a visible or visual disability. Maybe you have an eye injury and you've got a patch on and you don't have your depth perception. Maybe you've just gone to the eye doctors and they've put those drops in your eyes and your eyes are dilated and you can't focus very well. Maybe you've got an oral migraine, which is where it causes like spots or just like blackness to fill part or all of your vision. Sometimes, if you go back to that coffee shop example, or depending on where you sit in your house, maybe the bright sun outside is shining down on your screen. That can make it really hard to see in low contrast situations. Or maybe like the fire example, your eyes are agitated because of allergies, which again, very seasonal, but not always. Maybe you forgot your reading glasses and so you just can't see. Or maybe like me, you're just getting old and you need different glasses. So, visual accessibility benefits everyone. So those scenarios that I've gone through, those are real life scenarios. Those, at least in some form, have all been experienced by myself. I'm pretty sure most of you have probably experienced some piece of those as well. But there's lots more scenarios. So I encourage you to come up with your own examples. Think about how you're using your site, how your parents use your site, how your kids use a website, and think about the things that they may come up against. And share. Share these examples, your own examples, anything you can with your community, with your peers, with your coworkers, anybody who might be involved with using a website, not even making a website, because the more people that know, the better we're, are, we're all going to be, because it ends up spreading. 
And ultimately, by sharing and having more people understand this, we can help normalize accessibility. So I hope, by now, you can all agree, making your website accessible makes it better for everyone. That's it for me. So feel free to contact me at any of those sources. And if we have any questions. Three other, uh, actually four other accessibility opportunities that I that work when I'm talking to a client who is reluctant to get involved in accessibility. Number one, Google is the biggest internet user in the world and it is blind. Very true. If you, your client might not care about the 20% of people who have disabilities, but they may care about SEO. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Another thing, uh, up to 20% of internet users may be either drunk or high. <laughs> Which we... Uh, uh, Would uh, you mind if I included that? No, please time? do. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in my 20s, I had a bad drug interaction. I was taking medication and it conflicted with another one and I lost... My, my vision went away and luckily I had a phone back with a dial and I could braille my way around the phone to call 911. If I'd had a smartphone, I wouldn't have been able to. Yeah. And uh, so, and number three, I have a, one client that uh, is an abuse hotline uh, resource. And sometimes if you've been beaten up badly or been in an accident, or if you're just driving, and you weren't paying attention, and then you were in an accident, either before or after your accident, it is really handy to have your phone be able to, to be able to navigate a website audio, uh, with audio, mm -hmm. or with uh, have it read stuff back to you. Those are things that happen to people who don't expect, or who, who may not have sympathy for people with built-in or long-term disabilities, but please add those because those can get through to people yeah. who might not ordinarily think that accessibility matters. Yeah, and I've actually been saying that to a few people recently that, you know, lots of clients, they're willing to invest tons of money on SEO because that was the buzzword that's gotten through to everybody now. But lots of the things that you do to make thing, your site accessible are also beneficial to your SEO. Not just from the Google reading perspective, but just in general, too. Um, and another thing, if you're just trying to convince a client to take accessibility seriously, uh, at least in the United States, plaintiff's attorneys are actually finding websites to go after on purpose. Um, oh, the, yeah. the way that they make money is they scare you with a lawsuit and they want you to settle out of court and they move on to the next one. So their business model is scaring you into paying out of court. They don't care that your website is actually helping people or not. It's just a way to get money out of you. But you should be doing accessibility for all the reasons you mentioned anyway yeah. and to legally protect yourself. Yeah, exactly. And you know, unfortunately, I've even heard of some people, some clients who have said, we did the risk calculations. It's cheaper for us to get sued. But suing, the suing thing does often scare enough people, but we have to get them to know it's more than that. Make you awkward. I'm just wondering if you have any favorite tools or um, things that help with accessibility, whether it's for WordPress or plugins and such like that. Yeah. Um, one of the easiest things to do is check that color contrast. Um, if you Google co uh, contrast checker, the first one usually comes up is by webaim.com. I think it's just web A I M. Dot com, and you can punch in your two colors, your background and your foreground, and it will tell you 
if it passes for AA or AAA, because there's different standards, and it will tell you if it passes those for regular size text, large text, or um, graphical interface items, because there are different levels that it needs to be for those. So that's one that I use constantly when I'm checking designs. Um, there is a Chrome extension called Wave, like just Wave. Uh, it'll do a quick scan of your site. It'll pop up um, a thing on the side that will show you not just issues, but also just information. So it'll tell you, it looks at your heading structure to see if it's in the right order, and it'll show you this is what your heading structure is, so you can confirm that it's what you want. It will show you contrast errors as well. Uh, it will show you alt text that it thinks is missing or needs to be checked. Um, and then it shows you what ARIA labels you have on it, but it doesn't tell you if they're right or if you should have any others. But if you're familiar with that kind of thing, it does give you that information. So that's a, that's a good one to just sort of do sort of a quick check and try to get some of those low hanging fruit issues. Um, and then there's another one. I can't remember what it's called. I'll have to get back to you on that. I'll post it on Twitter. <laughs> but the one I'm thinking of, it does a bit more of a, a complex check. And there is also, there's a, there's a Chrome Developer Tools extension by a company, I think they pronounce it DQ, it's D-E-Q-U-E, -E, um, the company name, and they have a Chrome extension called Axe that actually sits in your dev tools, and I think you can run a scan there, and it'll parse your code and, and see if your code looks okay. Hi, do you have a tool or method when you're testing for tabbing? Because I don't usually use just my keyboard. So I'm curious, how do users use tabs and mm -hmm. keyboard? And is there a way for us to test that? Yeah, so the easiest way is to literally just try it yourself. Hand, put the mouse away and see, and check and see, is the behavior of, can you see where you are when you're tabbing? So do you have those focus um, indicators? Um, is it moving in a logical fashion? So is it going through all, like the menu and then down to whatever the next link or button is and then to the next one? Or is it jumping all over the place? Um, but there is, um, I think it's the tool that I can't remember the name of right now. <laughs> they have a sort of a simplified version and then they have a more extensive version. And in their extensive version, one of the things it will actually, as you tab through, it will track for you and it'll draw a line from each tab. So from here to here to here to here. So you can actually visually see where it's tabbing to. Uh, I see I have a plugin extension for uh, Chrome also, and it show uh, like colorblind what it's supposed to look like if you have colorblind. Mm -hmm. All these different disability, they can show a list there, and then you will see what the people see, Yeah, the way they, it is. Um, my question is, um, there is some website right now to quick fix the problem. They have an add-on plugin. When you click on it, there is a list and then do uh, the accessibility mm -hmm. uh, instead of uh, originally design it as uh, accessibility, mm -hmm. uh, for accessibility. So um, is it a trend right now or is it a, a way of doing add-on instead of designing through um, accessibility? Yeah. So that's a good question. And so those are called accessibility overlays. What they do is you'll see them on sites where they'll have like that little figure of a person, sometimes in a circle or whatever, um, and you click on that and it gives you a bunch of different options to do. Um, those are 
a bit of a hot topic in the industry because of course those companies claim that they are fantastic as you would expect them to do um, but the accessibility community in general from my experience um, they don't recommend those for a couple of reasons one big reason is a lot of people who rely on extra tools to help them navigate sites they don't like those tools and one of the reasons for that is sometimes it will actually hijack or break the tools that they're used to using every day so using you know sort of the most common example that we think of a blind person navigating on their computer navigating on a website they've got their screen reader set up they've got they've picked their their voice its gender the tone the speed they've set all of these things up and if your site goes yeah but I want you to use this and now I can't use what I'm used to that's not really helping me as much as you might think Two plugins that I've been using lately uh, on client websites. One of them, uh, it's a really cool plugin for authors. Uh, and let me see, I just had it a second ago. It's called Accessibility Checker. Mm -hmm. Is that the one by Equalize Digital? Yes. yes. And it's really cool. In particular, it, you can have it highlight the. Uh, it will like put a little orange box around as you go tabbing around so you can really see where you're going. It's got mm -hmm. contrast controls and other cool stuff. Yeah. And another one that I add to clients' sites is called One Click Accessibility. Mm -hmm. It puts up a little uh, drop down for users mm -hmm. that will let you do things like highlight links and uh, change the contrast, change font size. And that's also yeah. a good way if you don't, if you're not as enthusiastic uh, but it's also great on the front end if it's important that people be able to like see that uh, you know if you have like really busy backgrounds over text mm -hmm. uh, it lets you turn that off yeah and so, so and that kind of falls under that overlay that I was just talking about yeah it's not the ideal it's not situation. ideal you, it's better than nothing I do believe but um, yeah, and the one that you, the first one that you mentioned about, I haven't tested it out myself. It's on my to-do list, um, but from what I've seen and heard of it, it sounds really good. I've seen people in the WordPress accessibility community seem to be embracing it, and for that one, it is. It's, it's called Accessibility Checker because it's checking for different things for you. So that's really good as well. In the repo, plugin repo, yeah, and actually along those lines one of the other things I don't touch on in this presentation but has come up in in the community in general inclusivity is also part of accessibility and not to be plugging any other uh, plugins um, but Yoast with their SEO plugin has started putting in inclusive language options as well so they're doing some really cool things with that Hi. Um, I have a question about not the front view of WordPress for accessibility, but the dashboard. So mm -hmm. I did a website for somebody who was visually impaired, and she really wanted to do some updates on her own. And this was before the block editor, so I haven't explored it since then, but mm -hmm. it was a failure for her to try to update um, with her screen reader. And I'm wondering, um, has there been uh, an improvement in that? And is that a focus of the core project? And if you don't, you know, I don't know if this is an appropriate question, no. but I always think about it when yeah. I'm here at an accessibility talk. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I don't have full answers, but I have some answers. Um, so I don't know too much about when it was just the classic editor. I do recall, though, reading, so there is, WordPress is open source, anybody can contribute to it, there's lots of ways to contribute. There are official teams that are involved in, in creating it, one of them is core. One of the other ones is accessibility. So there is a group of people, and they're all volunteers, and they work as hard as they can to make sure everything is accessible, not just the front end, but also the back end. 
I do recall before the block editor came out reading like an open letter from somebody and it like half the accessibility team kind of just quit because they felt they weren't, they weren't being listened to. Um, I think things have improved from what I've seen. Um, I know that there are some good people working on it now. Uh, I do know that, of course, they don't always get to be the ones making and influencing the decisions and not everything that they put forward is considered priority for a partic particular launch. Uh, but they are trying, and I believe accessibility, when, when the block editor was being created, it was more top of mind is my understanding. I'm not part of the accessibility team, so this is just all stuff I've gleaned from posts and Twitter and, and all that stuff, but I hope it would be better for her now, and I think that is one of the things they try to keep in mind. Some things they still get overruled, but they do listen. I actually submitted, and this is the other thing too with WordPress being open source. If you ever find an issue or see an improvement, you can log a ticket, log a bug. So. This was a small thing, but again, being the aging neurodivergent, I don't always read things or interpret things the same way as a lot of other people. And you know when you go into the dashboard, and you've, uh, like the admin dashboard, and one of the widgets that's just default there is the events happening in your area. And you could actually change the location, but in order to do so, you had to hit a pencil icon. And to me, it was like, like I'm looking at Calgary, and then there'd be pencil. And I'm like, why would I want to edit how you spell Calgary? <laughs> so I realized one day I clicked it, and an input field opened up and let me put in, type in a different city. I'm like, oh, you don't want me to edit it. You want me to be able to search a different location. I'm like, that's the wrong icon. So I submitted a ticket and I marked it as an accessibility issue and actually I know some people say their tickets sit there for a long time and some do. Mine got put out in the next release. <laughs> so you're all welcome. <laughs> you can make a difference. Uh, yeah, the, for the person who was in the back, um, Firefox, the browser, uh, you know, we have the web inspector, they have an accessibility inspector too, so you can turn it on, it'll show you your tab index. So cool. it's, I think it's like tab view. So you can just Probably. see in one quick look your, where, where you're going. Is. And then for the overlay solutions, I don't think you should use them just as a Band-Aid, mm -hmm. but one of them is called UserWay, I think it's the most popular one. Um, it will, it's almost like it'll put a bunch of Band-Aids on and it'll tell you, now you need to go fix these things systematically. So oh, okay. it's, I don't think you should turn it on and say, now my accessibility is done, but it, it's at least a hit list of these are the most important things. Here's my my double A's that need to get fixed. My okay, so it's doing gun. a bit of a check for you as yeah, well. Yeah, you, you should use it like a, a full yeah. tool, not as a, I'm just gonna make my headache go away. That's good news. Yeah, it's good. That's probably, I haven't used any of those myself. Um, just see a lot about them, read them. I've, I've actually seen them um, on sites and once or twice I've clicked on them, I guess. But um, yeah, I would imagine that's not how it started. So that's a really good thing. I hope that's a trend we see in the rest of them. Can I make one more point? <laughs> Since we're talking about tools a lot, um, I just want to mention that lots of those tools, even the checkers, even the really good ones, they don't find everything. There are a lot of things that technology can't find. Things like technology would not have picked up that pencil icon because that was a contextual meaning that tech wouldn't understand. So there's a lot of things that you need a human to actually review and think about. Um, and even when you're doing alt text, not every image needs alt text. Not all alt text is good alt text. So it might go, yeah, you have alt text, good job. But if your alt text says DSC-045, that's no good alt text. <laughs> so something to keep in mind. Good? 
All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out. <laughs>